In the early 1800s, Timbuktu captured the imaginations of European explorers and treasure seekers like no other place. For centuries, tales of its immense wealth and rich culture had spread across Europe, making it as legendary as the fabled city of El Dorado. To many in the Western world, it was a mythical city somewhere in Africa, rumored to be overflowing with gold, hidden just beyond the mountains. While El Dorado remained a legend, never to be discovered because it never existed, Timbuktu was very much real. Today, anyone can find it on a map of Mali, situated in the heart of the country, on the Sahara's southern fringe, just a short distance north of the Niger River. Timbuktu was once a bustling hub of learning. From the 13th to the 16th centuries, it hosted a university. Scholars from as far as Cairo and Baghdad flocked here, drawn by its collection of hundreds of thousands of manuscripts on subjects ranging from astronomy, chemistry, and mathematics. These manuscripts are a treasure trove of African history, though many are now at risk of deterioration. Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Timbuktu was bustling with life and learning, home to an impressive 100,000 people. Remarkably, about one in every four residents was a scholar, a testament to the city's reputation as a beacon of knowledge. Today, Timbuktu might seem modest or even a bit neglected to visitors, but its past grandeur is still evident in its three ancient mosques and the legacy of its scholars. Its population is less than 19,000, just a fraction of what it was during its heyday 500 years ago. Much of its valuable manuscript collection risks being lost to terrorism, private collectors, or illegal trade. In 2012, Al-Qaeda militants overran Timbuktu, targeting the city's historic manuscripts and libraries for being against their interpretation of Islamic law. Abdel Qadr Haidara, a local librarian, orchestrated a daring rescue of approximately 200,000 manuscripts by smuggling them out of the city to safety. Additionally, some citizens of Timbuktu have hidden tons of manuscripts in secret places. These hideouts are well mapped out, with multiple copies of these maps shared by several families to reduce the chances of them being lost forever. Furthermore, a crucial effort to save a treasure trove of ancient knowledge nearly destroyed during an occupation by Al-Qaeda in 2012 is now underway. Thousands of manuscripts dating back centuries were rescued from destruction. Dr. Abdul Qadr Haidara and his organization, Savama DCI, have played a crucial role in preserving one of Africa's most significant written legacies. As of 2022, they have guarded around 40,000 manuscripts. These can be accessed online for free. See the video description. The Timbuktu manuscripts, primarily in Arabic, also include sections in African languages using the Arabic script, Ajami, and local languages such as Songhai and Tamashek. This showcases the rich multicultural and multilingual scholarly tradition of Timbuktu. These manuscripts, covering a wide range of subjects from astronomy to magic, offer a window into a world of knowledge spanning several centuries. Currently, efforts to digitize these documents are ongoing with 20% completed, but they're racing against time. The manuscripts once preserved by Timbuktu's dry desert climate now face the risk of deterioration in Bamako's more humid conditions. Despite ongoing conflict in northern Mali, there's a push to return these manuscripts to Timbuktu, their city of origin, highlighting their significance as a beacon of culture and learning in the Sahara. However, the security situation remains volatile, complicating efforts to preserve and celebrate this invaluable heritage. Despite these challenges, efforts have been made to preserve its ancient mosques and manuscripts. The city faces ongoing struggles with tourism and conservation, particularly with the threat of the Sahara's encroaching sands and new construction that could harm its historical sites. Next, let's review a few interesting finds from the Timbuktu manuscripts. This letter responds to Amir Ahmad of Massina, who had commanded the capture of a German explorer, Heinrich Barth, under the suspicion that he was spying for the British. The writer of this response, referencing Islamic law, argues that such an arrest is unlawful and refuses to comply with the Amir's order. According to the scholar, 
Islamic teachings protect a non-Muslim who enters Muslim territories peacefully, guaranteeing their safety from arrest, property seizure, or any form of obstruction. This book delves into the importance of ethical behavior in business and government, showcasing exemplary stories to underline the critical need for integrity among those in positions of authority. The author emphasizes the significance of maintaining ethical standards while holding an official role. This collection offers guidance on diagnosing and treating illnesses with detailed explanations on the medicinal use of animal, plant, and mineral resources. The author also incorporates prayers and verses from the Quran believed to aid in healing. Additionally, there are instructions for crafting written prayers, which can be used in amulets to benefit the sick. This document features responses to seven questions posed by the Emperor of Songhai, covering political and economic topics. The author recommends that the Emperor strictly follow Islamic law in these aspects of governance and consult with devout scholars for guidance. The 18th century scholar Al-Razmuki sheds light on a piece by Al-Samlali, a medieval mathematician. Through charts and sample problems, Al-Razmuki breaks down the basics of arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and delves into the history and evolution of mathematics. This text was widely used by students in Timbuktu. This compilation is styled as a platonic dialogue. It offers insights into identifying the rising star and interpreting its significance for the world. Other intriguing manuscripts include those on philosophy, Islamic mysticism, Islamic saints, laws governing slavery, commerce, inheritance law, poems, and complex astronomical principles. Timbuktu's allure isn't just in its scholarly past. It also thrived as a trade hub situated near the Niger River on the edge of the Sahara Desert. Historical evidence suggests Timbuktu was founded around the year 1100, but recent archaeological findings hint it could be much older, possibly dating back to as early as 200 AD, with signs of human activity from even the late Stone Age. There are indications of early, large-scale urban living and connections with early Saharan tribes. Artifacts like North African-style glass beads and copper in ancient burial sites suggest Timbuktu was a part of the bustling trans-Saharan trade by 600 AD, dealing in valuable goods like gold from the south and rock salt from the north. Salt, essential for preserving food and maintaining human health, was abundantly available in the northern Sahara, but scarce in the gold-rich regions of West Africa. Conversely, gold, which was mined in the forests of the south, was sought after by the wealthier societies of North Africa and Europe. This mutual demand created a natural market for trade. One of the most fascinating aspects of this trade involves the trust-based exchange system reportedly used by the traders. According to various historical accounts, Saharan salt traders would sometimes leave slabs of salt in predetermined locations and depart, leaving the gold unattended. Subsequently, gold traders from the south would arrive, leave an amount of gold dust they deemed to be a fair exchange for the salt, and take the salt with them. If the salt traders were satisfied with the gold left in exchange upon their return, the transaction would be considered complete. If not, they would leave the salt in place and wait for the gold traders to add more gold to the balance. This system, relying heavily on mutual trust, underscores the unique economic and social dynamics of the trans-Saharan trade. The exchange rate of gold for salt was not fixed and varied over time and place, but the value placed on these commodities was such that, at times, it was rumored a cup of salt could fetch a cup of gold dust. While likely an exaggeration, this saying illustrates the incredible worth of these commodities and the wealth that could be amassed through this trade. In Timbuktu, three grand mosques stand as iconic landmarks, known for their unique construction that includes sticks protruding from the sides. These sticks aren't just for decoration. They're actually used as scaffolding for maintenance work on the buildings. Around the year 1325, following a wealthy pilgrimage to Mecca by the leader of the Malian Empire, which included Timbuktu at the time, the construction of the Jingoreba Mosque, or the Great Mosque, began. This project was led by the talented poet and architect Abu Ishaq al-Saheli. 
The mosque saw major rebuilds in the 16th and 19th centuries. Made from mud, brick, and stone, the mosque features distinct conical towers and a tall minaret, with its flat roof supported by mud pillars and several stone arches. The Sankore Mosque, positioned in the northern part of Timbuktu, evolved into a significant center of learning. Its interior dimensions mirror those of the Kaaba in Mecca, Islam's most sacred site. The Sankore neighborhood, where the mosque is located, became synonymous with education, drawing scholars from all over to live, study, and teach, earning a reputation for academic excellence. Lastly, the Sidi Yahya Mosque, built in the city's center in the 15th century, underwent restorations and was reconstructed in stone by the French in the 20th century. Each of these mosques, with their historical and architectural significance, plays a vital role in the rich culture of Timbuktu. In the 16th century, Timbuktu, though famous for exporting gold, highly valued books as imports. Leo Africanus, a notable figure from that era, observed that the city was a hub for judges, scholars, and priests, who were well supported by the king for their dedication to learning. Manuscripts from Barbary, North Africa, were particularly sought after, fetching higher profits than other commodities. Education in Timbuktu, while centered around prominent mosques like Sankare, often took place in a more intimate setting within scholars' homes. According to researchers Hunwick and Boy, Islamic education relied heavily on the tradition of passing texts from teacher to student, ensuring the shortest and most respected transmission chain. Students learned by listening to dictations, writing their copies, and engaging in deeper studies through lectures and discussions. Scholars maintained private libraries to support their teaching activities. Abdel Kader Haidara, a modern researcher, highlights the challenges facing Timbuktu's manuscript heritage. Many of the manuscripts have been damaged over time by termites, moisture, and other deteriorative factors. While hundreds of thousands of manuscripts have survived to this day, the original number, potentially in the millions, has been significantly reduced due to these damages. The decline of Timbuktu, once a flourishing center of scholarship and learning in Africa, marked a significant turn in its history, beginning in 1591. This pivotal year saw the city fall to an invading force from Morocco, known as the Saadi dynasty, whose soldiers were equipped with muskets, a technology that gave them a considerable advantage over the local forces of the Songhai Empire, which had been the power overseeing Timbuktu. The fall of Timbuktu to the Moroccan invaders was not just a military defeat, but also a cultural and academic setback. Up until that point, Timbuktu had been a beacon of Islamic scholarship and education. The invasion and subsequent control by Moroccan forces disrupted the academic activities that had made Timbuktu a legendary city in the Sahara. Although the invaders continued to exploit the city's economic resources, particularly its role in the trans-Saharan trade, the scholarly community suffered. The occupation led to the dispersal of scholars and a decline in the patronage that had supported the city's academic institutions. The vibrant intellectual exchange that had characterized Timbuktu's universities and madrasas diminished, and the production of scholarly works slowed. Furthermore, the fall of Timbuktu was a critical blow to the Songhai Empire, which had been the dominant power in West Africa. The empire itself began to fracture and decline in the wake of the Moroccan invasion, losing control over its vast territories. The disruption caused by the invasion and the shifting power dynamics in the region had long-lasting effects on the political and cultural landscape of West Africa. But as the city's scholars were driven out in the 16th century and trade routes shifted, Timbuktu's prominence faded. French colonization later dealt another blow to its historical significance. Drawn by stories of immense wealth, European adventurers tirelessly sought Timbuktu, a city shrouded in mystery. However, it wasn't until 1828 that René Caillier, a French explorer, managed to reach Timbuktu and survive the journey back, unveiling some of the city's secrets to the Western world. Following this, France expanded its colonial reach across West Africa, establishing control over Timbuktu as part of its empire. This colonial rule persisted until 1960, when Mali, including Timbuktu, achieved independence, marking the end of French governance in the region.
Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter.